18% of J.P. Morgan companies. By 1850, James Rothschild, the heir of the French branch of the family, was said to be worth 600 million French francs, 150 million more than all the other bankers in France put together. He built this mansion called Ferrier, just east of Paris. Wilhelm I, on seeing it, exclaimed, kings couldn't afford this. It could only belong to a Rothschild. Another 19th century French commentator put it this way, there is but one power in Europe, and that is Rothschild. There is no evidence that their predominant standing in European or world finance has changed. Now let's take a look at the results the Bank of England had produced on the British economy and how that later was the root cause of the American Revolution. By the mid-1700s, the British Empire was nearing its height of power around the world. But Britain had fought four costly wars in Europe since the creation of their privately owned central bank, the Bank of England. The cost had been high. To finance these wars, the British Parliament here had borrowed heavily from the bank. By the mid-1700s, the government's debt here in Britain was 140 million pounds, a staggering sum for those days. Consequently, the British government embarked on a program of trying to raise revenues from their American colonies in order to make their interest payments to the bank. But in America, it was a different story. The scourge of a privately owned central bank had not yet hit. This is Independence Hall in Philadelphia where the Declaration of Independence and Constitution were signed. In the mid-1700s, pre-revolutionary America was still relatively poor. There was a severe shortage of precious metal coins to trade for goods, so the early colonists were forced to experiment with printing their own homegrown paper money. Some of these experiments were successful. Franklin was a big supporter of the colonies printing their own paper money. In 1757, Franklin was sent to London. He ended up staying for the next 18 years here, nearly until the start of the American Revolution. During this period, the American colonies began to issue their own money. Called colonial scrip, the endeavor was very successful. It provided a reliable medium of exchange, and it also helped to provide a feeling of unity between the colonies. Remember, colonial scrip was just paper money, debt-free money, printed in the public interest, and not backed by gold or silver coin. In other words, it was a totally fiat currency. One day, officials of the Bank of England asked Franklin how he would account for the newfound prosperity of the colonies. Without hesitation, he replied, That is simple. In the colonies, we issue our own money. It is called colonial scrip. We issue it in proper proportion to the demands of trade and industry to make the products pass easily from the producers to the consumers. In this manner, creating for ourselves our own paper money, we control its purchasing power, and we have no interest to pay to no one. This was just common sense to Franklin, but you can imagine the impact it had on the Bank of England. America had learned the secret of money, and that genie had to be returned to its bottle as soon as possible. As a result, Parliament hurriedly passed the Currency Act of 1764. This prohibited colonial officials 
from issuing their own money and ordered them to pay all future taxes in gold or silver coins. In other words, it forced the colonies on a gold or silver standard. For those who still believe that a gold standard is the answer for America's current monetary problems, look what happened to America after that. Writing in his autobiography, Franklin said, In one year, the conditions were so reversed that the era of prosperity ended and a depression set in to such an extent that the streets of the colonies were filled with unemployed. Franklin claims that this was even the basic cause for the American Revolution. As Franklin put it in his autobiography, the colonies would gladly have borne a little tax on tea and other matters had it not been that England took away from the colonies their money, which created unemployment and dissatisfaction. The inability of the colonists to get the power to issue their own money permanently out of the hands of George III and the international bankers was the prime reason for the Revolutionary War. By the time the first shots were fired in Lexington, Massachusetts, on April 19, 1775, the colonies had been drained of gold and silver coin by British taxation. As a result, the Continental Government had no choice but to print money to finance the war. At the start of the Revolution, the U.S. money supply stood at $12 million. By the end of the war, it was nearly $500 million. As a result, the currency was virtually worthless. Shoes sold for $5,000 a pair. Colonial scrip had worked because just enough was issued to facilitate trade. As George Washington lamented, a wagon load of money will scarcely purchase a wagon load of provisions. Today, those who support a gold-backed currency point to this period during the Revolution to demonstrate the evils of a fiat currency. But remember, the same currency had worked so well 20 years earlier during times of peace that the Bank of England had Parliament outlaw it. Towards the end of the Revolution, the Continental Congress meeting here at Independence Hall grew desperate for money. In 1781, they allowed Robert Morris, their financial superintendent, to open a privately owned central bank. Incidentally, Morris was a wealthy man who had grown wealthier during the Revolution by trading in war materials. Called the Bank of North America, the new bank was closely modeled after the Bank of England. It was allowed to practice fractional reserve banking. That is, it could lend out money it didn't have then charge interest on it. If you or I were to do that, we would be charged with fraud, a felony. The bank's charter called for private investors to put up $400,000 worth of initial capital. But when Morris was unable to raise the money, he brazenly used his political influence to have gold deposited in the bank, which had been loaned to America by France. He then loaned this money to himself and his friends to reinvest in shares of the bank. And, like the Bank of England, the bank was given a monopoly over the national currency. Soon the dangers became clear. The value of American currency continued to plummet. So, four years later, in 1785, the bank's charter was not renewed. The leader of the effort to kill the bank, William Findlay of Pennsylvania, explained the problem this way, quote, This institution, having no principle but that of avarice, will never be varied in its object to engross all the wealth, power, and influence of the state. The men behind the Bank of North America, Alexander Hamilton, Robert Morris, and the bank's president, Thomas Wiling, did not give up. Only six years later, Hamilton, then Secretary of the Treasury, and his mentor, Morris, rammed a new privately owned central bank through the new Congress. Called the First Bank of the United States, Thomas Wiling again served as the bank's president. The players were the same, 
only the name of the bank was changed. In 1787, colonial leaders assembled in Philadelphia to replace the ailing Articles of Confederation. As we saw earlier, both Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were unalterably opposed to a privately owned central bank. They had seen the problems caused by the Bank of England. They wanted nothing of it. As Jefferson later put it, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations which grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. During the debate over the future monetary system, Another one of the founding fathers, Gouverneur Morris, castigated the motivations of the owners of the Bank of North America. Gouverneur Morris headed the committee that wrote the final draft of the Constitution. Morris knew the motivations of the bank well. Along with his old boss, Robert Morris, Gouverneur Morris and Alexander Hamilton were the ones who had presented the original plan for the Bank of North America to the Continental Congress in the last year of the Revolution. In a letter he wrote to James Madison on July 2nd, 1787, Governor Morris revealed what was really going on. The rich will strive to establish their dominion and enslave the rest. They always did. They always will. They will have the same effect here as elsewhere if we do not, by the power of government, keep them in their proper spheres. Despite the defection of Governor Morris from the ranks of the bank, Hamilton, Robert Morris, Thomas Wiling, and their European backers were not about to give up. They convinced the bulk of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention to not give Congress the power to issue paper money. Most of the delegates were still reeling from the wild inflation of the paper currency during the Revolution. They had forgotten how well colonial scrip had worked before the war. But the Bank of England had not. The money changers could not stand to have America printing her own money again. So the Constitution is silent on the matter. This grievous defect left the door wide open for the money changers, just as they had planned. In 1790, less than three years after the Constitution had been signed, the money changers struck again. The newly appointed first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, proposed a bill to the Congress calling for a new privately owned central bank. Coincidentally, that was the very year that Amschel Rothschild made his pronouncement from his flagship bank in Frankfurt. Let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws. Alexander Hamilton was a tool of the international bankers, and he wanted to create the U.S. Bank, the BUS of the Bank of the United States, and did so. Interestingly, one of Hamilton's first jobs after graduating from law school in 1782 was as an aide to Robert Morris, the head of the Bank of North America. In fact, the year before, Hamilton had written Morris a letter saying, a national debt, if it is not excessive, will be to us a national blessing. A blessing to whom? After a year of intense debate, in 1791, Congress passed the bill and gave it a 20-year charter. The new bank was to be called the First Bank of the United States, or BUS. Here we are in front of the first bank of the United States in Philadelphia. The bank was given a monopoly on printing U.S. currency, even though 80% of its stock would be held by private investors. The other 20% would be purchased by the U.S. government. But the reason was not to give the government a piece of the action. It was to provide the capital for the other 80% owners. As with the old Bank of North America and the Bank of England before that, the stockholders never paid the full amount for their shares. 
the U.S. government put up their initial $2 million in cash. Then the bank, through the old magic of fractional reserve lending, made loans to its charter investors so they could come up with the remaining $8 million of capital needed for this risk-free investment. Like the Bank of England, the name of the Bank of the United States was deliberately chosen to hide the fact that it was privately controlled. And like the Bank of England, the names of the investors in the bank were never revealed. Many years later, it was a common saying that the Rothschilds were the power behind the old Bank of the United States. The bank was sold to Congress as a way to bring stability to the banking system and eliminate inflation. So what happened? Over the first five years, the U.S. government borrowed $8.2 million from the Bank of the United States. In the same five-year period, prices rose by 72 percent. Jefferson, as the new Secretary of State, watched the borrowing with sadness and frustration, unable to stop it. I wish it were possible to obtain a single amendment to our Constitution, taking from the federal government the power of borrowing. Millions of Americans feel the same way today. They watch in helpless frustration as the federal government borrows the American economy into oblivion. So, although it was called the First Bank of the United States, it was not the first attempt at a privately owned central bank in this country. As with the Bank of North America, the government put up most of the cash to get this private bank going, then the bankers loaned the money to each other to buy the remaining stock in the bank. It was a scam, plain and simple, and they wouldn't be able to get away with it for long. But first, we have to travel back to Europe to see how a single man was able to manipulate the entire British economy by obtaining the first news of Napoleon's final defeat. Here in Paris, the Bank of France was organized in 1800, just like the Bank of England. But Napoleon decided France had to break free of debt, and he never trusted the Bank of France. He declared that when a government is dependent upon bankers for money, the bankers, not the leaders of the government, are in control. The hand that gives is above the hand that takes. Money has no motherland. Financiers are without patriotism and without decency. Their sole object is gain. Back in America, unexpected help was about to arrive. In 1800 Thomas, Jeff 1800, Thomas Jefferson narrowly defeated John Adams to become the third president of the United States. By 1803, Jefferson and Napoleon had struck a deal. The U.S. would give Napoleon $3 million in gold in exchange for a huge chunk of territory west of the Mississippi River, the Louisiana Purchase. With that $3 million, Napoleon quickly forged an army and set off across Europe, conquering everything in his path. But the Bank of England quickly rose to oppose him. They financed every nation in his path, reaping the enormous profits of war. Prussia, Austria, and finally Russia all went heavily into debt in a futile attempt to stop Napoleon. Four years later, with the main French army in Russia, 30-year-old Nathan Rothschild, the head of the London office of the Rothschild family, personally took charge of a bold plan to smuggle a much-needed shipment of gold right through France to finance an attack by the Duke of Wellington from Spain. Nathan later bragged at a dinner party in London that it was the best business he'd ever done. Little did he know that he would do much better business in the near future. Wellington's attacks from the south and other defeats eventually forced Napoleon to abdicate and Louis XVIII was crowned king. Napoleon was exiled to Alba, a tiny island off the coast of Italy, supposedly exiled from France forever. While Napoleon was in exile on Alba, temporarily defeated by England with the financial help of the Rothschilds, America was trying to break free 
of its central bank as well. In 1811, a bill was put before Congress to renew the charter of the Bank of the United States. The debate grew very heated, and the legislatures of both Pennsylvania and Virginia passed resolutions asking Congress to kill the bank. The press corps of the day attacked the bank openly, calling it a great swindle, a vulture, a viper, and a cobra. Oh, to have an independent press once again in America. A congressman named P.B. Porter attacked the bank from the floor of Congress, saying if the bank's charter was renewed, Congress, quote, will have planted in the bosom of this Constitution a viper, which one day or another will sting the liberties of this country to the heart, close quote. Prospects didn't look that good for the bank. Some writers have even claimed that Nathan Rothschild warned that the United States would find itself involved in a most disastrous war if the bank's charter were not renewed. But it wasn't enough. When the smoke had cleared, the renewal bill was defeated by a single vote in the House and was deadlocked in the Senate. By now, America's fourth president, James Madison, was in the White House. Remember, Madison was a staunch opponent of the bank. His vice president, George Clinton, broke a tie in the Senate and sent the bank into oblivion. Within five months, England attacked the U.S. and the War of 1812 was on. But the British were still busy fighting Napoleon, and so the War of 1812 ended in a draw in 1814. Though the money changers were temporarily down, they were far from out. It would take them only another two years to bring back their bank bigger and stronger than ever. But now let's return to Napoleon because nothing else in history more aptly demonstrates the ingenuity of the Rothschild family than their control of the British stock market after Waterloo. In 1815, a year after the end of the War of 1812 in America, Napoleon escaped his exile and returned to Paris. French troops were sent out to capture him, but such was his charisma that the soldiers rallied around their old leader and hailed him as their emperor once again. In March of 1815, Napoleon equipped an army which Britain's Duke of Wellington defeated less than 90 days later at Waterloo. Some writers claim Napoleon borrowed five million pounds from the Bank of England to rearm, but it appears these funds actually came from the Ouvard Banking House in Paris. Nevertheless, from about this point on, it was not unusual for privately controlled central banks to finance both sides in a war. Why would a central bank finance opposing sides in a war? Because war is the biggest debt generator of them all. A nation will borrow any amount for victory. The ultimate loser is loaned just enough to hold out the vain hope of victory, and the ultimate winner is given enough to win. Besides, such loans are usually conditioned upon the guarantee that the victor will honor the debts of the vanquished. This is the Waterloo battlefield about 200 miles northeast of Paris in what today is Belgium. Here, Napoleon suffered his final defeat, but not before thousands of French and Englishmen gave their lives on a steamy summer day in July of 1815. Right over there, on June 18, 1815, 74,000 French troops met 67,000 troops from Britain and other European nations. The outcome was certainly in doubt. In fact, had Napoleon attacked a few hours earlier, he would probably have won the battle. But no matter who won or lost back in London, Nathan Rothschild planned to use the opportunity to try to seize control over the British stock and bond market and possibly even the Bank of England. 
Rothschild stationed a trusted agent, a man named Rothworth, on the north side of the battlefield, closer to the English Channel. Once the battle had been decided, Rothworth took off for the Channel. He delivered the news to Nathan Rothschild a full 24 hours before Wellington's own courier. Rothschild hurried to the stock market and took up his usual position in front of an ancient pillar. All eyes were on him. The Rothschilds had a legendary communications network. If Wellington had been defeated and Napoleon was loose on the continent again, Britain's financial situation would become grave indeed. Rothschild looked saddened. He stood there motionless, eyes downcast. Then suddenly he began selling. Other nervous investors saw that Rothschild was selling. It could only mean one thing. Napoleon must have won, Wellington must have lost. The market plummeted. Soon everyone was selling their consoles, their British government bonds, and prices dropped sharply. But then Rothschild started secretly buying up the consoles through his agents for only a fraction of their worth hours before. Myths, legends, you say? 100 years later, the New York Times ran a story which said that Nathan's grandson had attempted to secure a court order to suppress a book with this stock market story in it. The Rothschild family claimed the story was untrue and libelous, but the court denied the Rothschild's request and ordered the family to pay all court costs. What's even more interesting about this story is that some authors claim that the day after the Battle of Waterloo, in a matter of hours, Nathan Rothschild came to dominate not only the bond market, but the Bank of England as well. Whether or not the Rothschild family seized control of the Bank of England, the first privately owned central bank in a major European nation and the wealthiest, one thing is certain. By the mid-1800s, the Rothschilds were the richest family in the world bar none. They dominated the new government bond markets and branched into other banks and industrial concerns. In fact, the rest of the 19th century was known as the age of the Rothschilds. Despite this overwhelming wealth, the family has generally cultivated an aura of invisibility. Although the family controls scores of industrial, commercial, mining, and tourist corporations, only a handful bear the Rothschild name. By the end of the 19th century, one expert estimated that the Rothschild family controlled half the wealth of the world. Whatever the extent of their vast wealth, it is reasonable to assume that their percentage of the world's wealth has increased since then. But since the turn of the century, the Rothschilds have cultivated the notion that their power has somehow waned even as their wealth increases. Meanwhile, back in Washington in 1816, just one year after Waterloo and Rothschild's alleged takeover of the Bank of England, the American Congress passed a bill permitting yet another privately owned central bank. This bank was called the Second Bank of the United States. The new bank's charter was a copy of the previous banks. The US government would own 20% of the shares of the bank. Of course, the federal share was paid by the Treasury up front into the bank's coffers. Then, through the magic of fractional reserve lending, it was transformed into loans to private investors who then bought the remaining 80% of the shares. Just as before, the primary stockholders remained a secret. But it is known that the largest block of shares, about one-third of the total, were sold to foreigners. As one observer put it, it is certainly no exaggeration to say that the Second Bank of the United States was rooted as deeply in Britain as it was in America. So, by 1816, some authors claim the Rothschilds had taken control over the Bank of England and backed a new privately owned central bank in America as well. After 12 years of manipulations of the U.S. economy on the part of the Second Bank of the U.S., the American people had had just about enough. Opponents of the bank nominated a dignified senator from Tennessee, Andrew Jackson, 
the hero of the Battle of New Orleans, to run for president. This is his home, the Hermitage. No one gave Jackson a chance initially. The bank had long ago learned how the political process could be controlled with money. To the surprise and dismay of the money changers, Jackson was swept into office in 1828. Jackson was determined to kill the bank at the first opportunity and wasted no time in trying to do so. But the bank's 20-year charter didn't come up for renewal until 1836, the last year of his second term, if he could survive that long. During his first term, Jackson contented himself with rooting out the bank's many minions from government service. He fired 2,000 of the 11,000 employees of the federal government. In 1832, with his re-election approaching, the bank struck an early blow, hoping Jackson would not want to stir up controversy. They asked Congress to pass a renewal bill four years early. Naturally, Congress complied, then sent it to the president for signing. But Jackson weighed in with both feet. Old Hickory, never a coward, vetoed the bill. His veto message is one of the great American documents. It clearly lays out the responsibility of the American government towards its citizens, rich and poor. It is not our own citizens only who are to receive the bounty of our government. More than eight millions of the stock of this bank are held by foreigners. Is there no danger to our liberty and independence in a bank that in its nature has so little to bind it to our country? controlling our currency, receiving our public monies, and holding thousands of our citizens' independence would be more formidable and dangerous than a military power of the enemy. If government would confine itself to equal protection and, as heaven does its reigns, shower its favor alike on the high and the low, the rich and the poor, it would be an unqualified blessing. In the act before me, there seems to be a wide and unnecessary departure from these just principles. Later that year, in July 1832, Congress was unable to override Jackson's veto. Now Jackson had to stand for re-election. Jackson took his argument directly to the people. For the first time in US history, Jackson took his presidential campaign on the road. Before then, presidential candidates stayed at home and looked presidential. His campaign slogan was, Jackson and no bank. The National Republican Party ran Senator Henry Clay against Jackson. Despite the fact that the bankers poured over $3 million into Clay's campaign, Jackson was reelected by a landslide in November of 1832. Despite his presidential victory, Jackson knew the battle was only beginning. The hydra of corruption is only scotched, not dead, said the newly elected president. Jackson ordered his new Secretary of Treasury, Louis McLean, to start removing the government's deposits from the second bank and start placing them in state banks. But McLean refused to do so. Jackson fired him and appointed William J. Duane as the new Secretary of the Treasury. Duane also refused to comply with the president's requests. And so Jackson fired him as well, and then appointed Roger B. Taney to the office. Taney did withdraw government funds from the bank starting on October 1st, 1833. Jackson was jubilant. I have it chained. I'm ready with screws to draw every tooth and then the stumps. But the bank was not yet done fighting. Its head, Nicholas Biddle, used his influence to get the Senate to reject Taney's nomination. Then, in a rare show of arrogance, Biddle threatened to cause a depression if the bank was not rechartered. This worthy president thinks that because he has scalped Indians and imprisoned judges, he is to have his way with the bank. He is mistaken. Next, in an unbelievable fit of honesty for a central banker, Biddle admitted that the bank was going to make money scarce to force Congress to restore the bank. Nothing but widespread suffering will produce any effect on Congress. Our only safety is in pursuing a steady course of firm restriction. 
and I have no doubt that such a course will ultimately lead to restoration of the currency and the recharter of the bank. What a stunning revelation. Here was the pure truth revealed with shocking clarity. Biddle intended to use the money contraction power of the bank to cause a massive depression until America gave in. Unfortunately, this has happened time and time again throughout U.S. history and is about to happen again in today's world. Nicholas Biddle made good on his threat. The bank sharply contracted the money supply by calling in old loans and refusing to extend new ones. A financial panic ensued, followed by a deep depression. Naturally, Biddle blamed Jackson for the crash, saying that it was caused by the withdrawal of federal funds from the bank. Unfortunately, his plan worked well. Wages and prices sagged. Unemployment soared along with business bankruptcies. The nation quickly went into an uproar. Newspaper editors blasted Jackson in editorials. The bank threatened to withhold payments, which then could be made directly to key politicians for their support.